weil die Sonne und der Wind nicht privatisierbar sind. Sie sind allgemein gut aller Bewohner des Erdwalls. GDP being about stealing from Beim BIP geht es darum, etwas aus der Zukunft zu stehlen. Aber es ist in Wirklichkeit das Bestehlen der Gegenwart. Ich glaube, wir brauchen mehr Liebe. Deshalb sage ich Ihnen, ich liebe Sie alle. Folgen Sie am Herzen, brechen Sie die Regeln, bringen Sie es auf die Bühne. Den zehnten Erdgesprächen. Hello everyone at Earth Talk. Herzlich willkommen bei Earth Talks. Alles Gute. Herzlichen Glückwunsch. Guten alles Gute zum 10. Geburtstag. Alles, alles Gute zum 10-jährigen äh, Jubiläum der Erdgespräche. Alles Liebe zum Geburtstag. I was lucky enough to attend and speak. Ich durfte bei den Erdgesprächen im vergangenen Jahr sprechen und es ist wirklich eine phänomenale Zusammenkunft von sehr bedachten Menschen, so entscheidend die Menschen zusammenzubringen, sich zusammenzusetzen, gemeinsam Lösungen auszudiskutieren. Es ist auch wichtig, sich persönlich zu treffen, inspiriert zu werden und gemeinsam die so entscheidende Arbeit in Angriff zu nehmen weltweit, aber vielleicht auch neue Beziehungen zu knüpfen, neue Zusammenarbeitsmodelle aufzustellen, um unser Anliegen hinauszutragen. Ich danke allen, die es ermöglicht haben, zusammenzukommen. Herzlich willkommen Sie alle, alle, die das erste Mal bei den Erdgesprächen dabei sind und vielen herzlichen Dank an alle Redner, die ihren Beitrag leisten. Es wird fantastisch werden. Das Klima, der Planet und die Beziehung zwischen den Menschen und dem Planeten, auf dem wir leben, war noch niemals wichtiger, vordringlicher. Und ich freue mich zutiefst darüber, dass die Erdgespräche ihrer Arbeit nachkommen. Eine Arbeit, die noch nie zuvor so wichtig war. Es soll die tollste Veranstaltung werden. Vielen Dank, dass es sie bereits seit zehn Jahren gibt, dass sie so viele Menschen weltweit inspiriert haben, um diesen Planeten zu einem besseren Ort zu machen. Ich erinnere mich an 2014, als ich unter den Rednern bei den Erdgesprächen war und zweifelsohne war das die inspirierendste Umweltveranstaltung, an der ich je teilnehmen durfte. Ich möchte nur sagen, machen Sie weiter so und stellen Sie sicher, dass die Erdgespräche auch in den nächsten zehn Jahren am Programm stehen werden. Ich hoffe, nur so weiter. Ganz großartig, was ihr geleistet habt in den letzten Jahren. Ihr habt dieses Thema immer wieder in den Vordergrund gerückt äh, und auch gezeigt, wie man mit innovativen neuen Ansätzen die wichtigsten Probleme unserer Zeit lösen kann. Äh, dafür ein herzliches Dankeschön und ein Gratuliere. Ähm, ja, und es bleibt eigentlich nichts mehr über, außer zu feiern. Zehn Jahre Neon Green Network und zehn Jahre Erdgespräche. Alles Gute. Die Erdgespräche sind, glaube ich, heute noch wichtiger als jemals zuvor mit einem amerikanischen Präsidenten, der völlig verrückt geworden ist ist es wichtig, dass die Zivilgesellschaft sich engagiert. Ich wünsche gutes Gelingen und bleibe natürlich mit Herzen verbunden und werde zum 20. Jubiläum auf jeden Fall auch selber vorbeikommen. Alles Liebe, alles Gute und lasst euch nicht ärgern, genießt das Leben und freut euch daran, dass es Angie Ratai gibt und dass es einen grünen Bundespräsidenten gibt, der tolle Arbeit macht. And the first question is already on my mind. Was someone behind holding up the garden dwarf? Who shot the video? Please tweet me the information. I'm really interested in it. A wonderful good evening. Welcome to the 10th anniversary. It's great to see all of you. Welcome to the Earth Talks. My name is Manuela Reidel. I'm the facilitator and a reporter for Pulse 4 and a proud member of the Earth Talks family, even though I'm playing a minor role. Everything's being organized, and at the very last minute, I'm stepping up on the stage, saying, great, what you've been organizing, and then I'm your facilitator, moderator, guiding you through the evening. But it's great to be 
a part of this great family with the craziest person I love most, Angie Ratta. You will see on the stage a big hand for you, Angie. How the Earth talks in, turned into what they are today is part and parcel of the story we are going to tell you this evening. And we have fantastic keynote speakers for you this evening who we invited to provide us with some ideas. Many of the stories will upset us, will make us doubt humanity. And at the same time with the Earth Talks, we've managed every single year that eventually optimism reigned and we all were motivated highly. And I hope that after the event, you'll establish the first context for a better future over dinner at the buffet. Just a few housekeeping remarks. You can Twitter. My phone is lying around somewhere. I can certainly forward your Twitter questions under hashtag Earth Talks. Should during a keynote or any discussion something come to your mind you want to tell us, don't hesitate to Twitter. There is a free Wi-Fi network, Erdgespräche, A and E for the bloggers amongst you. And to make sure you all know there won't be a break because we have a very dense program and we want to make sure that you can spend a few hours over networking after our event. So therefore we are not going to have a break. Should you like to have a drink outside at the bar, water will be waiting for you the whole evening. So don't hesitate to get a glass of water. All our talks will be English today, so should you prefer listening to the German channel, simultaneous interpretation is waiting for you. I hope you've all got a headset should you need one. Should there be anyone who has forgotten to get a headset, please raise your hand so I can send a volunteer to you bringing a headset to you. There's someone sitting in the first row waiting for a headset. Please keep your hands up till you get a headset. That's great. Just to make sure you can listen to the German interpretation of our English keynotes. There's someone in the middle. I'll just continue. You keep your hands raised until you'll get a headset by one of our volunteers. Should you need any other assistance, please let us know. Just raise your hands. This is like sitting on an airplane. With the Earth Talks, it's about networking, as I've already pointed out. This is why we are particularly happy to welcome the managing directors of the three major environmental NGOs, Greenpeace Global 2000 and WWF. Thank you very much for attending our conference. And I would like to also welcome an honorary guest here. Some may already have seen you, have seen him. And this brings me to the absolute stars of this evening, our presenters, our speakers. One of them risks his life to save elephants' lives. His knowledge about the inner mechanisms of the ivory mafia keeps us awake during the nights. What we can do to support him is something you will hear this evening. A big hand for wildlife activist Andrea Costa. Take your seats. Was sie in You can take a pick. You can also try out the sofa if you'd like to. Yeah, it looks good. With the blue shirt it's all and, and, and all. Very good. <laughs> what she experienced as an environmental activist, as a crew member of the Rainbow Warrior, and what she wants to do today in order to save the European Union, we will hear from Bunny McDermott. And he is a Buddhist scholar 
and one of the leading activists and social reformers of Asia in his life. He has been nominated two times for the Nobel Peace Prize. He has been awarded the Right Livelihood Award and uh, many other international awards and prizes. How an economy could work that makes everyone happy is something he is going to tell us more about this evening. A big hand for Sulak Sivaraksa. Film, please. Good evening. My name is Robert Bullard. Uh, I'm an environmentalist. I fell in love on the planet. The planet is really a piece of art. For me, the meaning resides in nature. Because the sun and the wind cannot be privatized, they are common property belonging to all of us on this globe. The most important thing that I could be doing in the whole world. And there's not many people who get to think that. We wollen nicht mehr. We no longer want to be controlled by blind elites. No, we want to take our lives into our own hands. It's possible. We can do it. And we must do it. We must do that for our children, our grandchildren, and to defend the rights of future generations. Jeder kann was tun. Everyone can do something. Everyone counts. Everyone has their voice. You make change. Follow your heart, break the rules, and get it built. The law has created this problem, and law can amend it. Rule breakers really interest me, um, because when you live in exceptional times, uh, you need people who break rules. Population is not the challenge we once thought it was, but conversely, women's rights, we know, are some of the most powerful sustainability technologies we have. GDP being about stealing from the future. It's stealing from the present. Wachstum. Wirtschafts growth, economic growth, in this case, may be eco-growth, green growth. Growth is growth is in fact just simply a politics of optimism. What we need is living economies. For these living economies, it's bottom up. All of those memories stay with you. And for me, this is all about education. What we give our children is so important. Those moments of education, any experience we can give them to be outdoors, to be barefoot, to touch the soil, to understand their place in the environment, will stay with them, I can guarantee. Die Natur kennt keine braunen Böden. Die Nature doesn't know any brown soils, doesn't know any order, and does not know any monocultures either. Have been remarkable. And all the volunteers, to see that you guys are doing all this through voluntary work, I think this is amazing. It gives me hope. If there was anything like an idealism Nobel Prize, I would nominate you. As the solution to the environmental crisis, yes. But I think we need more love. This is why I tell you, I love you. Well, so many cool people, don't you think? But now it's high time to announce our first speaker, asking to come up on stage, a kind of uh, a hope carrier for all those who feared that the right-wing populism effect would take over in Europe and in the US. I'm pretty sure many French guys would like to call him and ask him how to go about uh, avoiding the many things he's shown us. But today he is here as a new patron of the Earth Talks, a big hand for our federal president, Mr. Alexander van der Bellen. Uh, 
Danke schön. Thank you. Thank you. At some point, somebody is going to explain to me what a patron or a Schirmherr in German, a gentleman with an umbrella is. But anyway, I enjoy being your Schirmherr or your patron. I can't see anything out there in the room. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this is normally how you start a talk. Dear friends is what I would love to add. First of all, I would like to thank you for the friendly invitation by Adam Pavlov, the Managing Director of Neon Green Network and the Earth Talks. He and his co-organizer, Andrei Karzai, have brought so many distinguished guests here, many activists, the way you see them sitting here around the room. Otherwise, they wouldn't be here. I believe there's no need to enumerate all of them. So like Sivaraksas has already been welcomed. He's already present physically. Andrea Krosta is going to talk about how he saved elephants and himself. And Bunny McDermott, well, we know her at least from literature. Back when in New Zealand, the rainbow warrior of Greenpeace uh, was sunk by the French Secret Service, if I remember correctly. Now, we are confronted with such things, and unfortunately, we have to count on them happening. Now, something that really impressed me, coming here for the 10th time to the Earth Talks, uh, or this network and this dialogue, this mutual inspiration, and the fact that different people coming from many countries and many backgrounds, and they are jointly, and the emphasis is on jointly, trying to build a better future for spaceship Earth. I don't like it. It's a technical, uh, it's, a, it's a concept from the technosphere, so let's just call it planet Earth. Congratulations on the 10th anniversary. That's quite an achievement to have organized the Earth Talks for 10 years running. I know this based on former experience of my own person. Angie Rata is also here for the 10th time tonight. And Angie, in an interview she gave in 2015, said, we no longer want to mull over problems. We know the problems. We want to motivate people to do something about it. This applies to environmental policies, protecting the climate, and for all kinds of policies in general. And so it's about this motivation of motivating each other to do something concrete, to do something to make sure that this planet remains viable, not for the planet's sake, but for our own sake, because we live here and our children and grandchildren will be living on this planet. And this dream, this dream moves more and more people on this world who do not want to be discouraged or demotivated. They want to dream of a peaceful community. Let's put it in uh, a bit more pathos, who want to preserve uh, creation, as Catholics put it, and the more simple people like us maybe call it differently. So it takes a lot of energy, a lot of patience, and we need to maybe exhort ourselves, encourage ourselves. I'm a simple economist, as some of you may know, and at the University of Vienna started uh, reading about the problem of uh, climate change from the economic point of view, and that was maybe 30 years ago. And we, the economists uh, at the time, were made aware of this real problem. And then the climate researchers, physicists, and others should uh, have worked uh, developing the issue maybe 20 years earlier than that. And then it takes another 30 years for the Paris Agreement. So these are long time periods. 
maybe even the lifespan of a human being. But it is still worth it. It is well worth uh, spending all the energy and uh, coming up with the optimism, this positive spirit, because one day we will be able to not only discuss these essential problems of the future, but to also take decisions accordingly. I believe that is another reason why they're here. In order to hear how other people did it, you decided to assume responsibility, you decided to do something concrete. This can and will, I'm convinced, turn into something new and in the past 10 years, something has evolved and I have my uh, pathos late in day today, so if I can consider every one of you as a source of hope, then we have this uh, little brook which will turn into a river, a stream, which will get things in motion. There's no need carrying coal to Newcastle. I think that you all know that we are faced not only with uh, the climate challenge, but also the water scarcity and the uh, diversity of uh, animals and plant species. But, of course, we are staying with it and will stay on the ball. There will be several conferences in Vienna uh, referring to the same topic. The next one coming up, I think, will be on the 20th of June. None less than... Arnold Schwarzenegger will support us in the R20 Austrian World Summit. Arnold Schwarzenegger, as most of you will know, has his own very effective uh, organization, Protecting the Climate, that helps implementing projects protecting our climate in cities and regions, so at the sub-state level, where real grassroots action is happening. So he supports information about, and he also supports best practice examples, in particular in the area of climate protection. So welcome back on the 20th of June in the Wiener Hofburg in the Vienna Imperial Palace, not in my own private office, of course, but right next door in the Hofburg. And I believe that we here in Austria who have decided decades ago to uh, say no to nuclear power. And for decades, we have been leading in the area of uh, protecting our uh, environment and our climate with some setbacks, of course. We have to mention those too, but I think we would be well advised to carry this idea forward and as an economist, being an egotist, also from the economic point of view, because in many of these markets, you can also make quite a lot of money. And making money with good things is something beautiful, after all. So all the best. Congratulations on your 10th Earth Talks. And stay the way you are, full of energy, activists, committed. Thank you. Thank you. Now, and that, dear patron, is the initiator of the Earth Talks. The reason why we're all here tonight, Angie Ratai. How are you doing, Angie? Well, what adrenaline can do to a body is incredible. I've had two very long days, and I feel that uh, my energy level is still quite satisfactory due to my adrenaline output, which is tremendous. But one year ago, during the last Earth Talks, I think if I had had a wish for the 10th Earth Talks one year ago, the wish would have been 
that we have uh, this inaugural speech by Alexander van der Bellen uh, in this capacity as a president, because a year ago we were still in the runoff election. So to have the president uh, as an opening speaker, this is really great. Dear president, I think what we can say if you're a patron, of course, if we misbehave, then your name is on the program. So we are going to try to make this a wonderful evening, and we'll carry on in now. Let's take a seat. Andrea Crosta is maybe the last hope for the African elephant. With a hidden camera and a lot of courage, he investigated the big business uh, with ivory. I don't know with whom I can share it. Die von ihm gegründete whistleblowing platform. The whistleblowing platform Wild Leaks wants to fight against poachers and other environmental crimes. Bye bye. Dank seiner undercover Arbeit. Thanks to his undercover work, some of the most brutal poachers have been arrested. Neon Green Network welcomes Andrea Crosta. The clip. Oh. Yeah. He has it. Oh, he's there. Okay. Done. So good afternoon. Back and forth. That's fine. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. It's a, it's a gigantic room full of people. It's a great honor. Um, I'm, I'm really grateful and, uh, and, you know, to the organizer for inviting me. I'm, not just because I can share with you pieces of my work and life, now they merge together, there's no more difference between one another, but also I can talk about a very important issue, which is wildlife crime. And you might not be so familiar with, uh, with the concept of wildlife crime and what is wildlife crime and what it's doing to all of us. And uh, we are not talking only about wildlife crime. I'll, 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 I'll talk about an intelligence-led approach to wildlife crime, which is what we are doing in, with, with our organization. So uh, how uh, we merged the world of conservation and wildlife protection, that you probably all know about it, with the world of professional intelligence and investigations and technology. Use this uh, set of skills to protect wildlife um, and the environment. Uh, before that, there are, be, um, the organizer asked me to add a few biographical elements to the story because, you know, it took, took a long circle for me to get here and, uh, and maybe someone has similar, uh, inform similar stories. So I was born uh, there, uh, two hours more or less from Milano in Italy. I cannot imagine a place more far away from wilderness and nature and, and, and wild animals and, uh, and, when I, and unfortunately or fortunately, I was born with this huge passion for animals and for wildlife with desire to protect them. Since I was really a kid, like five, six years old, uh, my only link to nature was actually the dog of my grandmother. That's the only animal I had around me. And, you know, it's a time, you know, I was a, a city boy and then a teenager in the, in the 70s and in the 80s, no internet, no Facebook, lousy TV, super expensive international flights, so I kind of stuck there with my dreams. And I had a very, very specific dream, and please don't laugh about the next slide. I wanted to become like her. That's my, my dream was to be a park ranger in a national park in Canada or the US. That was my dream, very, very precise. So taking care, protecting birds and wolves and deers and mooses and forests and maybe some tourists, and, uh, and, uh, but mostly animals. <laughs> Um, and I got stuck with this dream for a long time. I mean, I was un until I was uh, middle high school, so you can imagine the jokes. They call me grizzly bear, they call me teddy bear, that this is the nice things they call me. So, but, you know, I, that's what I wanted to do. And I got stuck with that uh, for a long time until when I turned 17, one of the many turning points, my father allowed me to go to South America to join uh, an expedition to the Amazon, to Venezuela, to to reach a beautiful place, it's called Salto Engel. I don't know, if it's, what, it's, a, it's the highest waterfall in the world. It's almost a thousand meters of water. 
I don't know how I got, I mean, my, I, I think my parents were divorced, so they, uh, they, were, they felt guilty and I leveraged on that and they allowed me to go because it was crazy, I'm 17 years old, can you imagine? So it's, uh, but I, I got there and it was an unbelievable experience, you know, for a, such a young age to, I don't know if any of you ever went to, a, to the jungle, any jungle, it's a, it's a super, super powerful place and to, to be able to touch those trees and to hear, I mean, changed my life. And I kind of dropped the park ranger dream. I said, okay, maybe it's not gonna happen, but, uh, but I want to be part of all these. I want to study these, I want to be involved with this. I didn't really know how, but I, I started from a scientific point of view. So fast forward a few years, I went to the university. Uh, I, I study natural science at the University of Milano with a thesis on European author, then I start working on a, a well-known uh, foundation, small foundation in Italy, sp specializing in conservation and uh, endangered species as a breeding center. And I was there for a few years. Then, then you know, life happened and uh, um, many things changed. I lost my mother when I was young, I was just 24 and I had other problems so I need to kind of make a living and I didn't get much money from con the conservation work. So I continued to work in pro bono and I shift completely and I went into business. And uh, with a natural science uh, degree, so kind of surrounded by people telling me I was crazy. And, uh, and out of the blue, I established the very first, one of the very first e-commerce company, companies in Italy for, for shopping online, selling the best of Italy to the rest of uh, the world. Um, it was the prehistory of internet, it was 98, like Google was founded in, in 98. Three years, a lot of success, uh, a lot of media attention, money from, donor, from investors, and uh, the first case history of Microsoft uh, for e-commerce in Italy. Then life happened again, and this time Nasdaq crashed. Uh, and the company lost. I lost everything almost overnight. Investors disappeared. I sold, uh, I sold it for the debt, so I made zero. And, uh, but that was a very instructing experience. You know, you can imagine doing everything, including technology, was like making, I don't know, doing a two PhDs in three years on that. And this technology led me to other kind of technologies, security-related technologies, and security-related technologies that took me to security services. And to make a long story short, for over 15 years, 16 years, I had a very unique job. I was, in, I was working as a private consultant in between governments and security vendors and large corporations, and some of you would say, oh, he was working for the devil. I was not working for the devil. I was right in the middle of many <laughs> devils. I was just do my best to remain clean. And I did everything. I did uh, crypto, uh, encryption, and security of uh, important uh, critical sites, uh, working with the government, uh, uh, anti-piracy off the coast of Somalia during the anti-piracy years. We're working with technologies for law enforcement. And I, you know, after 15 years, I kind of thought, okay, that's my, probably that's my life. I was very, very unhappy. Uh, something was very big was missing. I didn't understand exactly what. And then five years ago, what, another turning point, probably the most important so far. Um, I was in Kenya for a security assignment, working with a for a client, and, uh, and one day I wanted to go to the bush, I wanted to see some elephants, I, I knew the rangers, so I said, okay, let's, can I come with you, see how you work? I, I, we got, you know, rumors of a poaching incident, I just wanted to, to see. I apologize in advance for the next slide. I will keep it only for a few seconds, because it's the only horrible slide of my presentation, but you have to see what I saw, because that changed my life. Okay, he was slaughtered with a calf, also small. Uh, I hope they did this when he was completely dead. And, uh, and I, will, uh, I will just change it immediately because I know it's, it's, not, it's, it's not a nice view. This is a, what is left of elephants from northern Mozambique in the Kirimba National Park, 5,000 elephants gone in probably five years. And there's a guy building something. So I was, I mean, it was a cathartic moment for me. I was in front of this elephant and you have to understand the situation, the, the heat, the noise, the, the, the smell, and the faces of the rangers. Is, uh, and, and, but what happened in that moment is that seconds before, 
I had in front of me all these many, many pieces of the puzzle of my life completely all over the places, and I could not see the picture. I saw all these pieces, but no picture. And after this event, I saw the picture. I said, okay, now I know exactly what I do want to do. I drop this, just leave this my job, and I want to try to protect them, try to fight back for them. Because you learn why, you know, this is why they killed them. This is a picture we took in Beijing uh, uh, a year and a half ago. This piece is probably $300,000, or this in Hong Kong. Um, so it's, I said, okay, let's, I drop everything, and I want to create something new. Not join an existing organization, make my own organization, and, and make it, you know, I, I'm not ashamed to, th that I thought, I, I want to hurt some bad people now, so it's time for us to hurt bad people. No hate, just anger. <laughs> no, really. No, believe me, that just, just, just anger, because it's, you know, it's a, Africa is a very complicated situation. We all hate poachers, but then poachers are just poor people who want to make a living, and, you know, the temptation is, it's a very complicated story. So I had, you know, conservation and wildlife protection many, many years there, but also I had, I had many, many years in, in these other sectors, intelligence, investigation, with a lot of, can you imagine, the people I met, the, the, the knowledge I have, and so I said, okay, you know what, I merged the two. And, and I created the Elephant Action League in the United States with a very specific, it's very specific what we do. We, you know, we investigate, we collect uh, information, we produce intelligence, we investigate, and then we try to fight back, you know, to move from research to, to action. Um, just a very quick snapshot of the Elephant Action League was we are a very young organization, just four years, uh, four years old. Uh, established in California. We don't have, of course, offices or staff in target countries. It would, become, it would be too, too dangerous. So we have a lot of people working for us in the field in some countries, but nobody knows who they are. So we don't have, otherwise they will become a liability immediately and dangerous for them. The mission is very clear. We protect nature through investigative and intelligence efforts. Uh, and, of course, the team background is very variegated, of course, conservation, but also intelligent, security, law enforcement. My two main collaborators at the moment are both very successful former FBI special agents. One of the two, a very, very, very successful undercover operative for 30 years who, that I kind of recruit them and, and, you know, and convince them to work for the environment instead of whatever they did before. We have one, <laughs> we have one guiding principle that I developed through the years, probably working with many clients. Every time I do something, I'm in the bush, I mean, I talk with the journalists, I'm here right now today, I'm asking myself, am I doing it in the interest of my clients? And you see a few pictures of my clients here. Am I doing it in, the, in their interest? Because it's you ha I have to report back to them before I report back to my board, before the donors, before the reporters, it's them. You can even mentally report into them every time you are. I, I, sometimes I do it. I'm not crazy. In the bush, the first animal I got, okay, I report to you on behalf of everyone else. What did I do for real? Not, you know, not for my ego or for, uh, for, other, for other reasons. So what is wildlife crime? A very quick uh, example of, in this case, is the rhino horn supply chain, but we can do it in, with many other examples, of course. There is a ground zero. The animal is poached, is killed, or, or captured if it's a live trade. This is a, a horn of a rhino that we pictured two weeks ago in South Africa. Then, there, then the horn changes a few hands, and he has to leave, the, in this case, the continent, so it goes through exit points. Uh, it gets the value, is, 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 of course, is growing. So this is the port of Mombasa. We did a little operation two years ago. Then we go to transit countries, very, very important, okay, where, where the main brokers are and when you have to hit. That was the big mistake of the past probably 40 years, just focus on the little poachers. This guy is a very, very big trafficker in Vietnam. We have been investigating him for more than a year. We also gave information to the government. I think in, in, in just one year, we saw dozens and dozens of horns going through him. And, 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 and if the whole network around is probably 500 horns. If you think about it, the South Africa loses 1,200 rhinos every year. Imagine the power that these people have. Um, and then you have the final market, the destination. This is a picture taken a week ago uh, in China, in southern China, and the red arrow is pointing to the little piece of rhino horn that is left. 
uh, for different reasons, of course. There's no time now to go into why they do it, but you know, they start with traditional medicine, now it's more wealth status symbols, so pendants and, and bracelets and statue and, and cups and stuff like that. A horn like this, it's, I mean, it's, the price is now between thirty and $60,000 per kilo raw, so you can imagine how much money you, you do. It's a very, very profitable industry. It's the fourth uh, 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 criminal enterprise in the world, according to uh, UNEP and Interpol. Uh, so we're talking about, as you can see, big, big bucks. You know, it's like uh, between 100 and $260 billion per year. But let's see what it did. You know, in the past 100 years, Elephants went to five millions, from five millions to 350,000. And, and in the past four or five years, 35,000 elephants kill every year. And every single elephant of these 35,000, it's a crime. It's a crime to kill it. It's a crime to take the ivory. It's a crime to smuggle the ivory. It's a crime all the way to China to sell the ivory. Rhino, 100 years ago were half a million. Now it's 29,000. In the whole Africa, only 25,000 rhinos left. The rest is in Asia. Ridiculous what happened to tiger. There were 100,000 tigers in the wild 100 years ago. Now 3,890. We almost know them by name. And th there are more tigers in captivity in Texas than in the whole Asia in the wild. Think about how stupid is that. Illegal trade, also part of wildlife crime. 22,000 apes, mostly chimpanzees, but also orangutans disappear in the trade in the past 12 years. And of course, every time you take a baby chimp, the minimum you do is to kill all the family. You cannot just get a baby chimp and go home. You know, it's more complicated than that. Illegal logging also, almost probably around half of the whole logging around the world is illegal. So what we do, the base is intelligence. We are an intelligence-based organization. We do intelligence work. So what is intelligence work? We work in certain countries in the shadow, we build permanent networks of sources, informants, and then there is a handler, and then there is a lead investigator, and then there is us, and we harvest, collect information continuously through years. And, and we, we, you know, we recruit new people, we collect material, documentation, picture, undercover videos, we understand who does what. And this is the base for everything, it's the foreknowledge to be uh, preemptive instead of all the time reactive. Then there is field investigation, which is different from, invest from intelligence. Intelligence is a permanent work. While investigation are target, we need, uh, you know, this time, this budget, we have these objectives. Uh, this is uh, DRC Congo. And then, of course, all the time we look for evidence. That's what we are, you know, we need fact and we record it because at the end of the day we need that. Because we have to confront government, not with rumors or whatever I heard, noise, it, facts. And then there is a very important part of sharing. And there are different kinds of sharing. This is an operation we uh, actually trigger in Thailand uh, uh, around two months ago. This is the Thai Royal Police. And, and because of our investigation, they I'll talk a little bit more in a minute, they arrested a, a significant wildlife trafficker and uh, confiscated a lot of it. They raided a, a facility, big facility outside Bangkok. Another way we work is we, pr we prepare what we call confidential intel briefs. So, Confidential reports, only for law enforcement, we put inside information that we don't put in the public report, like names and telephone numbers and, and license plates and everything we know, and we give it to the law enforcement, to the right person, most hopefully, not, not the corrupt one. And we, you know, hey, that's the work, free of charge, do something, you know, start your own investigation. And of course, whenever we can, we go public. This is the cover of one of our uh, of, of one of our um, report, Blending Ivory, is, on, is online. We, then we go, first they invite us, we go to TV and we, and we talk about it. Two examples of our work, Operation Game Over, uh, China and Hong Kong, 10 months of undercover investigation, China and Hong Kong, in and out, in and out with our teams. Uh, on the, on the, the, the focus was the, where legal and illegal overlap and where the legal system in China allows the laundering of enormous quantities of illegal ivory into the system. Uh, on, the, on one side, there's the port of Hong Kong, just to give you an idea of the size. On the other side, the illegal ivory outside Beijing. The second is the, is the operation I just uh, mentioned, Operation Australia in Thailand. Uh, we started to investigate this person more than a year ago. The reason is was because he was smuggling baby orangutans from Indonesia into Thailand and then onward. Uh, he, was, he was selling orangutans 
in Bangkok for $1,000 um, per, per baby. And then we lost them. Then we were following four orangutans, three of that. Three of them died for over sedation because every time they moved them, they sedate them. The fourth one was sold. We lost the trace. We got it back. And then we finally busted him um, a month and two months ago for birds. It doesn't matter. As long as we bust him, it doesn't really matter for what. Now he's in, out of bail, but collaborating with local police. Uh, this is the two of <laughs> the little orangutans smuggled by this person. Um, finally, another way we try to be innovative is always try to find, okay, what we can do new. So three years ago, we launched Wide Leaks, which is the very first uh, whistleblower uh, initiative for wildlife crime, and came from the realization, my realization, I was in the field, I was in the field many times, and th there's a lot of people who knows a lot of information they don't share, for various reasons, mostly because they're afraid. So I said, okay, let's build a website, start with a website, build on Tor, the Tor technology, which, you know, so anonymously and securely you can share information with us, video, documents, whatever you want, and then we, we do our best to, to, to work on it. So it's not, it's not just a website, it's a very proactive initiative. They send us information through the website, through Facebook, through Twitter, sometimes even in person. It goes through assessment, validation, action, and then we try to use this information the, the best way we can. Uh, we give it to law enforcement, we investigate ourselves, uh, we go to the media. And this is a snapshot of the first three years. We're going to publish a report in a couple of months of the first three years, but about 120 submissions in three years, 25 more or less useful. And as you can see, we get you know, deforestation in Mexico, Sumatra, tiger poaching in Sumatra, of course, uh, illegal live trade, documents from the custom in Hong Kong, all, all possible things. So it's not easy to... Of course, as you can imagine, evaluate everything. And this is the last chapter of uh, the Wild Leaks project. We just signed a collaboration with the National Whistleblower Center in Washington, D.C. It's basically a law firm specializing in whistleblowers. They start something now on uh, wildlife crime. And what we are leveraging is there are many laws in the United States that have, the, as a provision, they, they can give a lot of money to people with information, to whistleblowers. And, and we act in the middle we, as a buffer, so the whistleblower in, whatever, in Tanzania or Thailand or Vietnam can stay anonymous. Nobody knows about him. We represent him in front of the lawyers and the U.S. government, and if the information is good, he gets a lot of money. Just to give you an idea, last year, the government of the United States gave half a billion dollars to whistleblowers not a cent to wildlife crime, but the potential is huge. So in order to get the big fishes, not the small fishes, the big fishes, you know, corrupt government official and blah, blah, you need uh, to give something. Uh, this is, I, I, I just go very quickly through these uh, um, slides because they are for tomorrow for the workshop. So the only chance you have to see them is to come tomorrow for the workshop. Otherwise, you will never, ever <laughs> see them. Okay. And this is the last uh, slide. Um, how to join the fight. So unfortunately, we don't have volunteers in the field, as you can imagine. We, it's pretty complex also for, already for professionals. We work only with, with investigators or former law enforcement and anyway, people experience in also in, in working in very difficult environment. But social network, social media it are very important. Uh, you can do a lot there. You cannot just talk about uh, wildlife crime, which is, which is, uh, sorry, which is very uh, important and not enough discussed. You can talk about organizations like ours. You can even become our own, our online fighters. Go. There is so much wildlife crime happening online on Facebook and other platforms. They're selling all kinds of stuff. We get stuff. So go out and look for, you know, and I call us, of course, if you need any consultation, but there's a lot you can do yourself out there. When you travel, of course, uh, not just keep your eyes and ears open. We most, more than once we receive information from tourists, but also be careful of what you do and what you buy. Bef you know, buying a, a, a bracelet or, or, or a little statue behind can be could be wildlife crime. So be careful about that. This is a, 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 a phrase from the very famous photographer Ansel Adams. Why you know we have to fight our own government to protect the environment is true. It doesn't have to be like this. Uh, there, there are ways to work with governments, but you always have to keep them accountable for what they don't do, and especially for the lack of willpower, political will. Without political will, you don't achieve anything. And finally, 
of course, donate. You know, it's, we don't get money from governments, only from private people and foundations. And, uh, and, uh, and it's, you know, the operation, as you can imagine, are, are, are expensive. Uh, before leaving you, I would like to leave you with, uh, with a thought. Since that accident with the, with the elephant, since I saw that, I have three things in me. Uh, I have love, I have anger, not hate, anger, and I have determination. So I encourage all of you to look inside yourself for those three things. Uh, in my opinion, you need them together. You cannot do much with one or two of them. You need love, anger, and determination. And then, and then let's go out and kick some asses. So if you need in kicking ass, help in kicking asses, just, just call us. Thank you. People are appreciating what you're doing. I hope so, yeah. Um, Andrea, um, th the way you just described your work, you're really um, going up against people here who are willing to go over dead bodies. <coughs> so it's really dangerous what you're doing. Yes, it is. It, it's more dangerous for the people working with me and for me, uh, to be honest. I, I try to be in the field with them every sort of two months or so, because it's important for me to see. But they are the ones who pretend to be traders, who pretend to be buyers or businessmen and engage those people and, and maybe enter very critical meetings with uh, undercover cameras. So they are the real, you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the real deal here. And without them, we could not do much. Uh, we have uh, amazing teams of, uh, we have four or five Chinese, uh, young Chinese guys, amazing. They are doing a great job for us. Uh, Chinese, young Chinese are an amazing opportunity to change this world. Like if you, they just need guidance and, and be tutored. Yeah. Uh, we have people from Taiwan, from Africa, so we, it's a good, good, good team. Have you actually met, you said, just said, you don't hate people who, for instance, kill elephants for money because the situation is more complicated than that. Have you ever met people who, out of a lack of money or other yeah, opportunities? Of course. Yeah, of course. I mean, what you can expect, I mean, they, they offer you one, two, three years of salary and you have a family of 10 people maybe at home to kill an elephant, which, yeah. by the way, for them is not like for us. We see a beautiful, exotic animal. They see at best, a pest that can enter your crop and destroy your crop forever and you lose all the money for that year. So mm -hmm. how can you hate these people? They live, you know, they don't know what, you know, and I, I, if I will start offering uh, three years of salary to kill uh, an endangered animal here in Vienna, I will have a line, I think, yeah. of people. It, it's Even tem here, yeah. I it's temptation, so too, yeah. and mm. when you are, and again, exploitation of poverty is a very complicated uh, issue. It's not that simple to, mm. to debate, but. We got this one question over Twitter that says, why has the EU not supported a complete Annex 1 listing of the African elephants at CITES, C-I-T-E-S, CITES, uh, CITES. CITES, until yeah. today? Yeah. Do you feel that the EU feels like this is a problem far, far away, doesn't concern us at all? Yeah, I mean, to, to solve the problem, first of all, you have to understand it. Mm -hmm. And I always have the feeling that these people don't really understand the problem. So if you don't understand the problem, just forget about trying to solve it, of course. On the plus is far away. Plus there is a, a lot of politics. When they, they didn't uh, uplift elephant in Appendix 1, which is maximum protection, is mostly Appendix 1 all over Africa, but certain countries is Appendix 2, means, for example, that you can do trophy hunting and kill an elephant. You know, there is a lot behind the scenes and certain countries didn't want to take the responsibility to, uh, for example, to close the industry of trophy hunting in Zimbabwe or in Tanzania, for mm -hmm. example, so they prefer mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. not to take this decision. Okay. I'd obviously love to talk with you more, but we are already running 20 minutes behind. Sorry. Uh, it's so my fault. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not, it's not your fault. That's not what I was trying to say at all. But what I was... Uh, I'm switching back to German now. It's not a... I'm switching to...
<laughs> Would you like to help Andrea Krosta's work? You can use your smartphone immediately to make a donation for the Elephant Action League. Here you can see the necessary information to do so. Please do support this crucial work. Thank you very much again for Andrea Costa, a big hand. Thank you. Two more things Andrea already said, saying that you can see some of this information only when you join his Born to be Wild workshop in room D in the museum's quartier. And Johanna Nides, the WMF managing director, will be available as well. You can learn more about whether wildlife crime also affects Austria in a certain way. Please don't miss the Born to be Wild workshop at 11 tomorrow. And there is an awarded documentary that will be shown in the Burkino at 6 p.m. called The Ivory Game. And for all of these side events, you can choose what money you want to donate for all of these activities. That's your personal choice. I do assume that Angie Rattay would be very happy about the money, about you joining in the side events. Huge efforts taken here, Angie, in the last 10 years. You've been so crazy dedicating every single minute and second of your time to organize the Earth Talks. 130 guests attended the first Earth Talks. Now things have developed a bit. You are also successfully working as a graphical designer, being awarded a great many prizes for your work as well. Did you expect that after 10 years you'd be sitting on the sofa here facing so many people when you organized the first event? By no means, no way. 10 years ago, I opened Pandora's box, not exactly knowing what I was doing. In the framework of my diploma project, I wanted to make sure that many people I met in the course of the project, I wanted to bring together from civil society who, not all, who were not activists that time, who said, we want to do something, maybe we can develop some projects together, could you give me some advice? And for that, the Earth Talks were founded in summer 2008. I came up with the idea and Freda actually was the first speaker for the Earth Talks. It was exactly the same team. Andre, the project manager, was on board. Sasa Stanovic, the catering manager, and myself. And this remained the same until this very day. I think this is the quality of the Earth Talks and I'm very happy that uh, people like the idea and that we have found a nice niche for our event. When someone meets you right before the Earth Talks, asking you how are you feeling, you say, oh, well, the Earth Talks, we have sent out the invites. You are absolutely fulfilled with this task. You have lots of motivation, of passion, is that right? You raise your hand twice. Well, only recently did I have a talk with Matthias von Zimfilm. He said that he has never ever met anyone talking so fast. I always try to save money time. <laughs> well, I think I'm easily motivated. That's true. Probably because I'm a very imaginative person. I'm a very creative woman. That's why I studied design. And due to the education by my parents for cost reasons, but also because of our passion, we spent our holidays in the Tyrolean mountains. And I used every moment I had to spare to spend in nature. And when I see so many people, I can see each and every one of you as multipliers. Greg Craven, at our second Earth Talks back then in the Natural Historical Museum, said, be the virus. And he gave an example saying, if the 900 people sitting here only inspire another five, bringing about a trifle change in their lives, when you do your math, it's 4,500 people that tomorrow may already bring about a change because of the snowballing effect. That's what keeps me motivated. That's uh, what I see first and foremost. 
I don't think, oh, we are so small, we can't change anything anyway. What, with my flourishing imagination, I think about is what we can change, being so many of us. Who or what inspired you? Andrea just uh, told us where he started from, what his first hour was, a drastic picture. What was your trigger, the moment when you said, this is what I want to do? Like with Andrea, and I think that's what we need, as Andrea put forward, we need love and anger, the ambivalence, the opposition. It was a healthy shock for me, as I would like to put it. We saw it in one of the videos, it's the Chernobyl experience when I was aged eight, and then the Axon Valdez problem. You wanted to say thank you some, to someone. Thank you very much for reminding me. That's true. It's always difficult to say thank you to everyone. Our long-term partner, the Ministry for an Austria worth living in, quite a long title I would like to thank, and Peter Ivanovich, who unfortunately can't be with us today because they've been supporting us for all these years, they believe in us. We are the young, wild ones for them. When we stumble in, sharing our ideas with them, it's really great to be supported by them. Thank you for doing so. And from the Ministry for an Austria worth living in, I would kindly ask a lady, Mrs. Birgit Horvath, to come up on stage, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining us. The ministry organizes the Sustainable Action Days, one of the core topics for the Earth Talks. What's happening at the Action Days? Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for giving us an opportunity to introduce you to our initiative launched in Austria during the Action Days. It's our task to show what stakeholders, what uh, people acting in this field do. It's about commitment sustainable development in our environment, in our society, for the climate. And as with the Earth Talks, it's about showing that many people can do a lot in their private lives, in their professional lives. You all have great opportunities to stand up for our environment. That's a core element. And the initiative of the Sustainable Action Days wants to establish a platform making sure that this variety of stakeholders can be made visible for as many people as possible. It's about learning from each other, getting to know each other. You don't have to reinvent the wheel every single day. There are so many different opportunities. And on these platform initiatives, all of these opportunities become visible for many people. And when joining in these initiatives, people can motivate many, many people reaching out to as big an audience as possible. How you can participate, how you can let yourself be inspired, just uh, click yourselves in www.nachhaltigesösterreich.at, Sustainable Austria, it means literally translated to participate in the initiative, be inspired and enjoy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Birgit Horvath. And now it's my great pleasure to ask a man to come up on the stage, who for two reasons is also co-responsible for the Earth Talks, because he is a generous contributor on the one hand, and he manufactures a product that keeps Angie Ratai going and working when she works 24-7. A man you all know because he's a kind of an eco-pioneer. It's the chocolate manufacturer, Mr. Zotter. Please come to me, Mr. Sepp Zotter. Good evening to you, Mr. Zotter. Your microphone. Well, you can't see anything standing here on the stage. The light is so bright. What inspired you cooperating in the Earth Talks? What was your motivation? Well, I can't really say a lot. It's quite logical for me. The first time when I met Angie, I thought, incredible, obviously, we are soulmates. And when it's about talking fast, we are quite similar. 
normally we are overtaken by our own ideas, so obviously this is a clear team. In my company, this is the topic every day, and I heard that before, love, fighting, being angry to get things moving. Sometimes you have to be quite harsh, and this is why I really love this uh, Earth Talks, because there are so many people raising their voices. It's not the only good project you've been committing yourselves to. What other initiatives have you been launching? We work in an ecological way. We support fair trade. That's something I think uh, goes without saying. Currently, I'm doing a lot for drug prevention with my cocoa projects in Colombia and Peru. We primarily support cocoa farmers making sure that they no longer depend on drug production. They are not all drug addicts. Some of them are, however. And it works quite well with cocoa because that always was my approach taken. We want to make good chocolate. Duh. And uh, you need a cocoa man who is motivated, who likes doing their job, not saying that's a shit, I don't really want to do it, and the Europeans or the Americans should just eat it because I couldn't care less. That's not what we want to see. That's a logical development. And since most don't really get anything worth mentioning for their livelihood, certainly I would say almost 80% of them also grow coca. And when you know that there are the drug cartels and they pay in advance because that's the better business for them. And in our projects, therefore, we try to cooperate with the farmers in such a way that we pay back the prepayments of the coca cartels, coca cartels so to liberate them somehow, because when you as a farmer can't make the deliveries, someone will come to your door with a shotgun. And you know that, but when we get people out of this dependence, they can focus on cocoa production. We try to improve the quality. That's always my approach I take. We say we have to increase quality. Everyone will benefit from that. We have a better price. Our work will be easier and you'll get the better chocolate. We won't complain about the chocolate that's uh, wonderful and terrific. We are standing upright still. When you were to make a wish, any dream, any vision you would like to share with us, well, once I said, or oh, that's my vision to put it this way, I use as a headline, maximizing humanity is the biggest gain. I am an entrepreneur. I am also participating in our economy, and uh, I, at some point, realize that economy is something that can be a tool to set things in motion. And when it works well, that you redistribute everything evenly, keeping everything going, all will benefit from the situation, and therefore economy is something awesome. Even though when it is about this topic, when we look at what's happening on our planet by economists as well. And I think things are being done and I hope more will be done in the future. Thank you very much and a big hand to Sepp Zotter and Angie Rattai, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much. I think that change has to be made bottom-up. I have thought so for 30 years, for 25 years for sure, when I've been working as uh, a member of parliament, I learned how little the politicians may do, but they are not really basically or profoundly changing our main issues. Expecting a solution coming from the top is a fatal illusion. It has to be bottom up, based on people's strength and power who have realized that it's them who have to get proactive to do something. No lip service, but getting active. 
And I think the power of those at the grassroots level might be enormous. The approach of the Earth Talks, based on Freda's work, was the idea that everyone can do something. We need ideas and courage for doing so, but we also have to be inspired. And what's of crucial importance is showing role models and examples. That's what the Earth Talks are here for, and that's why the Earth Talks, I hope, will be a cool opportunity for each and everyone to meet peers when you learn what your action radius is, when you realize what a range you have, you will also find what you can change with the Earth Talks. It's about making the right decisions ourselves, but also encouraging people to get politically active, to deal with their political representatives, to exert some pressure, to roll up the sleeves and uh, turn into an activist tomorrow. It's now my great pleasure to welcome the Managing Director of the Earth Talks and uh, the great son of uh, Frieda Meissner-Blau, Adam Pavlov. The stage is yours. Hello, darling. Adam, this will be a longer talk. First of all, how are you doing? Great, I feel fine. Until about one minute before the event starts, my pulse is about 180 the moment it gets started. And we know the year of work is now being crowned by success. I'm fine. I'm really happy. That's great to hear. So this will be the next inspiring round. Bunny McDiarmid is a Greenpeace activist with heart and soul. We are all just like you guys. We are all just people who care about this place. 1984. In 1984, she joined the Rainbow Warrior as a deckhand, and in the next year, she protested against French nuclear tests. But two bombs of the French Secret Service sank the ship. One crew member died. Today, she's the managing director of Greenpeace International, fighting against nuclear power, the pollution of forests and oceans, and for a better future. Neon Green Network welcomes Bunny McDiarmid. Thank you. Whew. What a huge audience. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's um, quite heartening, but also inspiring to see so many people sitting in, in a conference or a meeting about the planet, and also to see so many young people. These lights are incredibly bright. I feel like I want sunglasses. <laughs> I'm told I have to stay within the boundaries of this green dot. Wouldn't it be great if everyone did that? <laughs> I've also, I've, we've got some pictures, um, but I've, that myth about women be, being able to multitask doesn't apply to me. So I've handed it to someone in the audience, so they're gonna click, click through some of the um, photos. Um, I just want to acknowledge Andrea for what all the great work that you're doing on elephants. Thank God you went through those life-changing moments. Thank God for all of us. Um, and instead of telling you about where I am today, I'm going to tell you a little bit about how I got here. And I hope you can understand my accent. You have to tell me if I talk too fast or wave at me if I'm saying things in an odd way in English, because I do realize even though I come from an English-speaking country, we have a strange accent in my place. And if you haven't worked it out by now, I come from New Zealand, otherwise known as Aotearoa by Māori, which is the indigenous people of New Zealand. 
And New Zealand is actually a country that's been very defined by activism. It was the very first country in the world to give women the vote. And we didn't get it because we asked nicely, we got it because we fought for it. For quite a long time. <laughs> I come from um, a big family. I had a really pretty conventional formal education. I went to university and I thought, I'll go to university and I'll learn about the world. And actually, the only thing I really learned there was how to read, which was quite a good thing to learn. But I figured out I needed to get out into the world to actually understand how the world ticked. And by the time I was 21, I was on a boat, a 100-year-old ship, um, wooden, nothing modern on it whatsoever. We had to cut wood put it in a wood-burning stove, bake bread on a daily basis. It was an extraordinary experience. I'd never sailed before. And one of the jobs that I got on the boat was replace the rotten pieces of timber below the waterline. I was also not a carpenter. <laughs> but <laughs> I did have a supervisor, thank goodness, otherwise we may not have made it across the Atlantic. But one of the things that taught me doing that job was that I could be and do something different from the piece of paper that I got from coming out of university. And that was quite an important lesson for me to learn as a young woman at 21 years old, that I could actually be more than what a formal education had taught me I could be. And from that boat, I shifted to another boat. I shifted to the Rainbow Warrior. I met the Rainbow Warrior in 1985, and actually I met the Rainbow Warrior, not Greenpeace. I'd actually never heard of Greenpeace <laughs> when I joined the Rainbow Warrior, but I loved what this boat was going to do. And this boat was going to, on an anti-nuclear campaign in the Pacific. Um, and at that stage in the world, nuclear was the big scary monster in the room. It was what frightened me as a young woman. It was the fear that was amongst many of us as young people. And I imagine it's not dissimilar from what a, young a lot of young people feel today about climate change. And when I met the warrior, I thought, OK, I'm going to join this because I want to be part of the anti-nuclear movement. I want to do something about it. And this was a group of people that were actually going to go out there and do something. And the first thing that the warrior did, after we turned it from a motorboat into a sailing boat, and oh my goodness, did she set, turn into a fine sailing boat. We went to a place in the North Pacific called the Marshall Islands, and we were going there so we could help the Rongelap community relocate. And the reason why these people needed to move away from their island was because they had been irradiated by a nuclear fallout from the U.S atmospheric testing program that had taken place there decades earlier. So, so this has happened to them 20, 30 years before the warrior arrived. But they had experienced an enormous amount of illness. They had jellyfish babies, they had kids that were ill. 90% of the children that were under the age of 10 at the time of the radioactive fallout had had thyroid cancer and their thyroids removed. One young man died of leukemia but neither their own government or the US government was willing to recognize what had happened. But they just sent doctors from the military establishments in the US on a regular basis to study these people, because they had this perfect controlled population that they could study about what the impacts of nuclear, nuclear contamination was. So they had invited Greenpeace to help them move to another island. So when we arrived there, all these older women came out in a small boat holding up a sign that said, we love the future of our kids. But they weren't ready to move. <laughs> Nobody had packed anything. So we spent the next few days sitting around with this community talking, along with their senator. And after those few days, they said, OK, now we're ready to pack, and now we're ready to move. So they took apart their entire houses, 
packed up all their belongings, got onto a boat with a group of people they'd never seen before in their lives and sailed to an island 100 miles away that many of them had never seen before either. And that was a huge decision for them to take. In the Marshall Islands, land is like part of your identity. It's your middle name. Everybody is born with land rights. Everybody is born with fishing rights. It's something you inherit, it's something you pass along to your kids. They say in the Marshalls that if you lose your land, your spirit goes too. So this was a major decision for this community to make, but they did it because they really believed it was the best thing to do for their kids and for their kids' kids. So that was an extraordinary thing for all of us to go through. Nobody was dramatic about it. Everyone just got on with the job. We shifted these people to this new island where there was no building set up, basically put all their plywood from their old houses into the water and it all floated ashore, and they started rebuilding their community. This is a story that not a lot of people knew about, not a lot of people in the US knew about, probably not a lot of people in the world know about. But it's a, it's a real story about, the, about nuclear legacy. Someone mentioned Chernobyl earlier here. And this was their Chernobyl. And it was also, but it wasn't just a story about nuclear legacy, which is intergenerational, as we've all found out and continue to find out. It was also a story of perseverance, resilience, speaking truth to a very big power, and also believing and imagining that you can create a different future, and then doing something about it. That really changed me, being part of that, because I learned that the, the kind of violence that we're doing to ourselves and to people, and the violence that we're doing to the earth, are very much connected. In New Zealand, they have a saying that says, I am the river and the river is me. And that's probably the, the shortest and the biggest version I've heard of explaining how intimately our fates and the fates of the planet or the fates of our living natural world are connected. What we do to the world, we do to ourselves. And the Marshallese taught me that and the people that I grew up around in New Zealand taught me that as well. The Marshall Islands and what happened in Rongelap is a bit like a metaphor of the biggest story in the world. It's kind of universal, and it's, it sort of describes a little bit what bonded me to Greenpeace and also what made me stay in Greenpeace for all these 30-plus years. After Rongelap, Oh, I've got to step back from the lights again. <laughs> After Rongelap, um, I stayed in Greenpeace, but I realised that I will probably always be a bit of an activist. And activism for me is quite a, a new... A, and being called an activist is actually quite a new word to me because I often thought I was just an, actually just a reasonably ordinary person doing doing ordinary things. And all of our histories, I think, have many, many examples of people who have, ordinary people who have done quite extraordinary things. People who have decided at one moment or another to stand up and say, no, I disagree, or yes, I'm going to be part of that. And that's what's often changed the world, these sometimes tiny, small activities by small groups or big groups of people that have actually shifted the axis of the world in a really major way. A few months ago, actually it wasn't even that long ago, even though it feels like that long ago, I participated in, a, in an action in Belgium. I climbed a 90 metre chimney with a bunch of other activists in the port of Antwerp. And this was the refi oil refinery of Total, which is one of the oil companies, one of the oil companies, that actually wants to drill at the mouth of the Amazon River. And at the mouth of the Amazon River is where they've also just recently discovered a coral reef, a very old and a very large coral reef. So this company wants to go there. This is one of these frontiers. 
wants to go to the Amazon, the mouth of the Amazon River, and drill for oil, potentially destroying this newly discovered coral reef, destroying the livelihoods of the communities that live in that area, but also looking for fuel that we cannot, we simply cannot afford to burn anymore. So I wanted to add my voice to many, many others to make sure that Total heard that this is the wrong thing to be doing. That was a reasonably big deal for me to do because I'm also not a climber. <laughs> I'm also not a climber. It was also a big deal for all the other climbers in that group to take me along with them. I was kind of a liability. Nobody wants to drop their international executive director from a 90-meter <laughs> chimney. Kind of changes the message you were hoping to put out there. But I, it was an incredibly satisfying thing to do. Moving into this job as an international executive director, it's not every day of the week you get to go and do something like that. So it was really, it was really wonderful to be able to do that. And it, was, it actually made my daughter really proud as well, which is quite a hard thing to do these days. <laughs> but in addition to that, what made it really satisfying was doing something with a group of people that had a common purpose and had enough courage to actually act together to do it. And that sounds big, but actually it's not. Doing something meaningful, millions of surveys will tell you, make people far more happy than buying more stuff. And doing, so, doing something with a group of people that feels meaningful is even better. It's so much more empowering, I think, and hopeful to actually act when you see a problem or when you feel overwhelmed by what's happening in the world than to just sit and panic. And I've been on a lot of boats now, so I know what it feels like to panic a bit. <laughs> and it feels way better to just get involved with trying to change the situation than panicking. The total, situ the total situation and our, our, our kind of campaign against new frontier oil is absolutely about climate change. And climate change for all of us is one of those issues that can either paralyze us or motivate us. And we, ha we simply have to be motivated. Our, our little planet is totally under attack. And guess who's, who's, the, um, who's the attacker? Us. We know we know that we are the cause of climate change. 97% of the scientists agree. The good thing is, we actually also know what the solutions are. The only thing we have to do now is make sure the political will is there to drive those solutions home. The Paris Agreement was really important, but it's not going to be effective unless we make sure what all those governments agreed to and ratified in lickety-split history-making time are not delivered. And that's where we all come in. We can't rely on the governments to do it. We've been talking about this for 25 years, and your president talked about how 30 years ago economists were talking about this. I remember going to Kiribati, which is another small island state in the North Pacific, and talking about climate change when the initial scientific reports were coming out in the late 1980s. And the president of Kiribati said to me, do you know what they're telling us? They're saying in 50 years' time, maybe our islands won't be habitable. 50 years after that, maybe our language disappears. And 50 years after that, our culture will no longer exist on this planet. And I thought, my God, this man got it like that. If only we could transfer his brain into all the brains of the politicians that sit in the, the places that are not moving on climate change. We have time. We actually have time to get to where we need to be. 
with climate change. We are, there's a lot already on the move, and there's a lot of hope out there amongst the business community and amongst many politicians as well. We can look at what happened in the US and go, shit. That's not going to be helpful. But you know what? What is extraordinarily helpful in the US is that the majority of Americans actually want to see action on climate change, many of them Republicans. A huge number of cities, mayors, local governments, businesses in the US want to see that change happen. So I think the Trump administration has a huge fight on its hand in its own country. But we will not get what we need without political will. And the political will will not be there without people holding their government's feet to the fire. And you know what? We need the EU. I am not a European. But we need a progressive Europe. Because a progressive Europe actually stands for many of the ideals, many of the values that I myself and Greenpeace are fighting for. There is an awful lot of messages out there today about hate, division, them and us, intolerance. I'm actually really proud to be part of a, a conference or a meeting that was opened by your president who, who believed that a progressive agenda was enough to be able to stop a pop, the populism and the anti I mean the authoritarianism, authoritarian, see I can't even say it, agenda and that trend that's driving a lot across Europe at the moment. We need to take that trend seriously and we need to take people's fears seriously as well. It's not that the EU is perfect. There are a lot of things that, that don't work. There's a lot of times when you can think that when you think that Brussels is just there for the elite, for big business, for corporates. It's our job to make sure that they're there for the interests of the many, of the people, and the planet. <laughs> the EU is probably one of the strongest symbols uh, that we have of nation states overcoming divisions and borders. And that's really important today. Differences are hard, I totally get that. But if you look at nature, it teaches us, it teaches us that diversity is absolutely essential to our survival. We can't live with monocultures. We need the differences. That is what's gonna make us strong. So I really appeal to you as a non-European <laughs> to make this a progressive Europe, to, make, to fight for, you, for a Europe that's really strong on environment, really strong on human rights, and really strong on political freedoms. We cannot take for granted what we've won. We cannot be complacent about that, because things can change just like that. We've seen it with Brexit, we've seen it in the US. So we have to fight for what we've won and not think it's just going to be there forever. We have to work in our communities and act when we feel like something's not right. Nobody needs to climb, or not everybody needs to climb a 90 meter chimney. There are many different ways that you can make a difference, small ways and big ways. We need the many sacrifices of the many to change things, not the big sacrifices of the few. This is a very, I think maybe this little planet we live on may be the only planet in the universe with life on it as we know it. It's precious. Humans are a force of nature. We can, but we're a conscious force, and we can be a force for good if we decide it. All we need is enough of us who have the courage to actually actively work together to make that change for the better and I've seen it time and time again. We can do it, so let's do it.
sorry. Bonnie McDiarmid, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much. Bunny, you have so much experience as an activist. We've seen your pictures now We're as a deckhand on the Rainbow Warrior. How do you feel about activism today? Has it changed a lot in the, uh, in the last 30 years? I think there's more people active today than there were 30 years ago. I think it's more possible for people to find ways to connect. That's a good side of the mm -hmm. internet, social media. It's a great organizing tool. People find people that think the same as them and want to change things the same way they do and find ways that they can do it together. Mm -hmm. I think there's many more ways that people are active today than I think they were even 30 years ago. And is it uh, a lot easier now to get uh, an ear of governments today? Do you think you're being taken more seriously by more and more parts of the world? It fluctuates. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Greenpeace certainly is a much bigger organization than it was 30 years ago. And, but Greenpeace will always have an inside-outside strategy. We want to be able to talk to people, convince people that this is where we should go to make the, the positive change we need, but we also want to be ready to act mm -hmm. because we can't rely on them to move in that direction, just Thank with talk. Yeah, of course. Thank you so, so much for your work. Thank you, Bunny. And uh, yes. <laughs> uh, your personal... Ex no, we're going back to German now, sorry. Yeah, we'll come back to German. Tomorrow, you can take your first step in terms of activism. Bunny will be there for the Greenpeace workshop. We live in strange political times, but as you all know, the EU wasn't spared, and this caused Greenpeace to launch the project Reclaiming the EU. So here you have all the information that you need to be there tomorrow for the workshop. It starts at uh, 3 p.m. in the museum's quartier. So as usual, there's a voluntary donation, and the Managing Director of Greenpeace for Central and Eastern Europe, Alexander Eget, will be there as well. And from the team van der Bellen, we have Johanna Stögmüller and Bunny will be there tomorrow as well. So we are looking forward to uh, seeing you in the Museum's Quartier, this same location tomorrow. And we just heard in the keynote speech that in the US we currently have a president who doesn't know about climate change. And this is what we're going to march against on Saturday, the People's Climate March, which is supposed to show solidarity with all those in the US who are tearing their hair out by the bushels uh, out of desperation in terms of uh, what's happening there. And this is also supposed to serve as a message or a little warning, so to speak, uh, for Austrian politicians. We are going to start at the Praterstern near Ausstellungsstraße Saturday at 2 p.m. You will find little brochures in the lobby where you can read up on the details. And now I would like to turn to another person who's in charge of us being here tonight, Adam Pavlov. Thank you. You have a very time-consuming job that has a lot to do with this event here. What do you normally do? I'm with Greenpeace in Austria. I'm the spokesperson for climate and energy questions. And why do you need your Earth Talks? What's the benefit of the Earth Talks? Well, I think these are two completely different kettles of fish. The work of Greenpeace is well known, and actually, this is owing to my boss. So for the Earth Talks, I think what makes for uh, the benefit of the Earth Talks is the diversity of topics. We always asked about the topics. Well, we don't have a central theme. It's just about 
maybe somebody is here tonight because he appreciates the work of Andrea Costa. And then, as an added bonus, on top of that, he also gets the presentation of Bani and of Sulak. So that's one aspect, and the other aspect is that uh, we try to be a role model, and this is embodied and exemplified by our speakers here, to show that change is possible if you have good ideas, if you tackle things, and if you have a lot of resilience and stamina, you can change the world, and we're trying to convey this to people. What can you do as an individual in light of these huge challenges we're talking about? I think as an individual, you can actually do quite a lot. At a more trivial level, you can bring about change in your day-to-day -day life by, for example, eating vegetarian food, biological food, organic food. You can do without a car. You can use renewable heat and power, things like that. But I think that in and of itself is not going to be enough. I think we as individuals can do a lot, but we must not... Uh, let politicians do their own thing. They are responsible. And I think we as individuals can remind politicians of their responsibilities, hold them accountable. And there are many ways of doing that. But tomorrow, for example, you can go to the governor, your mayor, or to your member of parliament and ask them why, for example, they have not dealt with X, Y, Z so far. Now, the Earth Talks have existed for 10 years now. The preparation's always a lot of fun. Now we have to keep Angie's puppies uh, to eat other people's food while we are discussing matters. So these are trivial things that happen. Do you have a little anecdote you would like to share with us? I think there's plenty that I could tell you about, but there's one anecdote that I remember, and that Angie will also always remember, is after five years of Earth Talks, we had Bianca Jagger here. And as the last name says it, she used to be married with Mick Jagger at uh, the heyday of the Rolling Stones, and she led uh, the life of a celebrity, and she wanted to be treated as such. And the day before the Earth Talks, she informed, informed us that she didn't have a presentation, but 1,200 pictures from her last trip to the Amazon region. And the picture that I have in mind is, well, she's in a hotel room. Of course, she called at the Hotel Sach and she got a suite for free. And when Angie and myself come to the hotel room, uh, with Bianca Jagger, she's in a bathrobe, uh, uh, barefoot, and we click through those pictures to somehow turn it into a presentation. I think this was the most scurrilous and one of the most fun parts. Well, there aren't a lot of people who spend a night with Bianca Jagger and sort through folders of pictures. Well, congratulations. <laughs> a little making of the Earth Talks you can see in the following video clip. I grew up on the outskirts uh, of Vienna in one of the council houses, and I think the only person who had an academic degree was the physician. So these people all were hard working, not really people who brought about change. And then 86, I played in this very place here, and my mom was on the balcony on the second floor, and she called, do come up right away, and she had a trembling voice, and she was really strict, and I thought something must have happened, I must have done something really bad, so I ran up, and the TV was on. It was uh, funny because uh, there were news at a time where actually we weren't supposed to be in the news, and then I heard about nuclear radiation and why these things can kill, even though you can't see it, and of course for a child it is hard to understand, and... I guess that had been a very important moment in my life for my career as an activist. I was nine or ten years old when my grandmother, Frida, told me stories about uh, this, 
mo movement uh, uh, in 1968 in Paris, the uh, fight against uh, Zwentendorf, the nuclear power plant, and against uh, the hydropower plant in the riparian forests near Heinberg. And I remember that these stories inspired me. Very few people turned against the state, against the police and police brutality. And they did not only rebel, but they even won against the police. And that was the first moment when the activists started to become active in me. Who am I? Well, there are certain things that I can't change, and I never liked that. I met so many people here who thought that they were really small and unimportant, and I thought that we need to do something. We need to do something together. I need somebody who takes pictures, who makes a video, whatever. And about 10 years ago, I met Angie, and Angie showed me the well, instruction leaflet for Planet Earth, her project, and she also talked to me about the idea of wanting to uh, organize the Earth Talks. And well, there were people who were full of ideas, and I was really pleased about that. And those weren't necessarily people who traditionally would be Greenpeace activists or WWF uh, members or whatever, or people from the Green Party. These were people who couldn't be put in a drawer. Um, well, they just wanted to do something. Let's tackle it, they said. Well, half an hour after we first met, I took her to Frida, my grandmother, and she then repeated the entire story. And then I thought that, well, there's no other title than Erdgespräch, your Earth Talks, and that's what it was. And here we are, thanks to Andy, thank, uh, Angie, thanks to Adam. But there are a couple of other people we need to thank. Well, there are numerous people and organizations whom I would like to say thank you to. But I would like to pick out two in particular. Maybe also on behalf or in lieu of many others. But the, at the end of this video clip, we saw the Sinfilm logo. I'd like to thank Matthias and Martin, who have really been indefatigable to uh, develop these video clips. So a big thank you to you. And I would also like to thank somebody else. For many years, we have had a wonderful partner, the Ökostrom AG, the Green Electricity Company. And this is the first time that uh, they are also the main sponsors of the Earth Talks. And thus, they have made a big contribution to support the Earth Talks. And they deserve a big round of applause for that. And the Ökostrom AG, or Green Electricity Company, have also managed to pull off a capital increase, the first capital increase that uh, went through crowd investing. Thank you to Adam. And now let's watch a clip how this crowd investing worked for Ökostrom Green Electricity. Well, in the German-speaking countries, we're the first ones who are offering shares via the crowd. Why can we do this? Well, we as pioneers have always been successful in our endeavors. In 1999, the Ökostrom AG was the first company in Austria that offered power exclusively from renewables. Now we have tens of thousands of customers that are supplied by us, and we have uh, many different ecological power plants, and another one is uh, added every year. We have grown very quickly, and we need you in order to continue this growth path. We are a great team with a lot of experience. We are moving in a growth market, and we are always pioneers. In 2013, for example, there's been a cooperation with Hofer, and for the first time, power was uh, sold via a... Um, uh, via Hofer, a, a supermarket chain. 
We are a broad-based uh, company with uh, 2,000 shareholders, and we only report to them. We're not a political group uh, that depends on political interventions, and therefore, Simon, uh, mini solar power plants, so everybody can produce their own power. With your investment, our wind and solar parks will be developed further. In the city, there's enormous potential for PV systems. We also want to extend our customer base to at least 75,000 customers by 2019. Together with our shareholders, we have a clear goal to have 100% renewables based electricity and energy. Together we can do it. Now you can invest in shares of Ökostrom AG under investieren.ökostrom.at. All right, ladies and gentlemen. And I have wonderful news for you. The sofa is so comfy, I need to move farther away from it because it's very attractive. Anyway, the Ökostrom AG, on the occasion of this event tonight, still has shares worth 100,000 euros that we have held especially for you. So 1,000 shares are still available for you to buy. So you have the chance of uh, going on to the website investieren.ökostrom.at, so you can buy shares there. Uh, the campaign is on until Sunday, and 10 people in this room are going to buy shares even tonight because we're going to show you some seat numbers, and if you happen to sit on this seat number, then please rise up. A volunteer will join you will give you a voucher for a share. And what's important is that after the Earth Talks, during the Come Together, you have to come to the Ökostrom AG Lounge, where you are going to get all the information that you will need how to move forward and how to get your physical shares. Now, please show on the screen who will become a shareholder of Ökostrom AG. There's a total of 10. Five, four, three, two, one, and here we go. Please rise up, congratulations. Thank you very much to Ökostrom AG for this wonderful campaign. And please do not forget, dear winners, to come to the Ökostrom AG lounge after the official part of this event tonight. And please remain standing while the volunteers come and join you and give you your vouchers. Let us say happy birthday, Earth Talks again. In the early days, when this event started. And I'm happy to celebrate the 10th birthday of the Earth Talks. Um, I think we are at a stage where the only way we will make peace within society is by remembering we are children of one Earth, that she's our mother, she's our common home, and it's through the Earth we are going to find our humanity, our common humanity because there are too many powers trying to tear us apart as human beings while they tear us apart from the earth. We are one humanity belonging to one planet. Let us celebrate it every day through our lives and resolve never to be uprooted from our real being, which is as earth citizens. In Zeiten, die manchmal echt zum Verzweifeln sind, helfen die Erdgespräche. The Earth Talks help shape the future in difficult times. Happy birthday. In the Niger Delta region of Nigeria. I have been a participant in the past of Ed Talks, which has been a very wonderful experience. On this occasion of its 10th anniversary, I want to say a very happy birthday.
the world is evolving in unexpected directions. And uh, unfortunately, the environmental sustainability agenda is becoming more and more sidelined with the political developments. And I think that your work contributes to the reinstatement of trust between the people. And uh, in my judgment, it's extremely important now because it's not enemies that create mistrust. It's mistrust which creates enemies. Happy birthday. Um, some of you may remember me from a talk I gave at Earth Talks a few years back. Um, I was the one who smashed the piglet, who criticised Descartes, and who played a little bit of didgeridoo. I'm here to congratulate Adam and Angie on wonderful 10 years of Earth Talks. Um, your passion, commitment and energy knows no bounds and we all appreciate you so much for what you've done um, to raise awareness of the environmental crisis and so importantly to show that commitment and action is a powerful force for change. We need people like you. You should be proud of what you've achieved in the last 10 years. Angie, Adam and also the rest of the team. Uh, be proud of it. Uh, you've done a lot. You've achieved a lot in these 10 years. And I think uh, uh, when I say happy birthday, Earth Talks, I uh, absolutely want to congratulate you on your great work. For 10 years now, we are talking about the Earth during the Earth Talks. But that's good. Maybe we shouldn't only talk about Earth. Maybe we should talk with the Earth. Hello, Earth. All the best to you. Happy birthday to the Earth Talks and to Earth. Well, Mr. Düringer's earth or soil looks really very good and fertile. I would like to ask somebody to join us on the stage uh, who's worked with the WWF. She now works uh, also for the ORF, the Austrian Broadcasting Authority. She's also in charge of the initiative Mother Earth, and she's also jointly responsible for a new award, a great award. Please tell us more about it. Our planet is under increasing pressure. Ecosystems are being destroyed. Resources are being exploited. The sea is being polluted. There's climate change. So our environment relies on a public that is better informed. Independent and critical journalism can bring this about. In a few moments, the first Austrian award for environmental journalism will be awarded. This uh, honors investigative journalism, high quality research and new approaches. Reportages will be awarded prizes that have uh, contributed to um, shape the opinion on relevant environmental issues. We have an advisory board that checked all the submissions for the relevance and for their impact on our environment. The award winners were Selected by an independent jury, Reinhard Güwey, the editor-in-chief of the Wiener Zeitung, Rainer Novak from the Presse, Nana Sieberg from Woman, Oliviera Staich. She is uh, with Standard 80, Armin Turn here, the publisher of Falter, Alice Farmer, editor-in-chief of the Tiroler Tageszeitung. Now, who are the winners of the 10,000 Euro Environmental Journalism Award 2017? And for this wonderful award, I would like to ask the initiator of the award to join me on the stage. A big round of applause for Hildegard Eichberger. Hello, good evening. There you are. Dear Ms. Eichberger, from your point of view, why do we need such an award? I think it is nothing new. If you want to make progress in protecting the environment, 
we need a well-informed public that is critically well-informed. So we need good, critical, investigative journalism for that. Environmental protection is not an easy topic. Often we're talking about long time periods and complex subject matters that don't make for a good story at first glance. And there are a lot of interests involved. And in this context, it is difficult to come up with good articles that reach the general public, that inform the public to be stubborn. And that is well worth an award. And with this prize, we want to motivate more journalists. And has it been difficult to select the awardees? Well, we're going to ask the jury members. They will award the prize. Now, it was easy and difficult at the same time. It was easy because we had a large number of submissions, 70 submissions in total, so we were quite surprised. And out of the 70 submissions, a lot would have been worthy of the prize. So we didn't think that would be the case. We thought it would be much harder to find a worthy awardee. And others will be able to tell you who the winners are. Now I'd like to ask two of the jury members to join me here, the editor-in-chief of Tiroler Tageszeitung, Alice Wagner, and the deputy editor-in-chief of uh, Woman, Nana Siebert. Good evening. Hello. Thank you for being here. Who would like to start? Mr. Varna. Who has won the award? Well, the first Austrian prize of environmental journalism 2017 in the category classical media print goes to Josef Gepp from Profil for his contribution, Energy Poor, Energy Poverty. Mr. Kep is on his way to us. The rationale is as follows. This contribution shows the impact of environmental policy measures on the economy and how difficult it is to take action at the energy policy level. This contribution deals very critically with a subject that is highly relevant in terms of protecting our climate. Congratulations. Dear Mr. Gepp, uh, this is your award. Congratulations. All right. Award winner number one will stay with us. Category two, who will do that? Well, the Austrian Award for Environmental Journalism 2017 in the category Classical Media Radio will go to Peter Liska from the ORF for his documentation, Snow from Tomorrow. Tomorrow's Snow. So if you're here, Mr. Liska, please join us on the stage. Congratulations, here's your award. And now the rationale from the jury. So the reason why I would like to award this prize is that document the documentary shows in a very relaxed but still very critical way what the ecological impact of climate change will be on a resource that is very important for Austria. This comprehensive research and the multi-layered approach uh, that you use to address the issue has convinced the jury. On behalf of Peter Liska, who couldn't make it, I would like to give the prize to Mr. Novak. Congratulations. Right, and we have one more category. 
Yes, the last category of the Austrian Award for Environmental Journalism is digital media, and the award goes to Julia Schilly and Sebastian Pumberger from Standard AT for the reportage Chernobyl uh, when you, Europe learns to fear nuclear power. Now, the reason why we discern this award is this is an article on a very relevant issue. It's robust and also well implemented in terms of its multimedia dimension. There's also a timeline that uh, is an additional benefit. So, Sebastian Pomberger, thank you very much for this wonderful production. So the jury team, the awardees, please join us for a group picture. Thank you very, very much for your valuable work and congratulations. Tonight is a night of the cool ladies, and I would like to announce one of them who will render a video message. A lady who is a journalist, a moderator, and an author got famous in the US, who uses her VIP status to stand up for democracy and human rights. In 1996, she was a co-founder of Democracy Now! Amy Goodman, the floor is yours. And host and executive producer of Democracy Now! a daily grassroots global news hour. I want to congratulate Earth Talks on your 10th anniversary of this critical gathering. I also want to welcome President Alexander van der Bellen as you and Austria work together at Earth Talks with your green president. People in the United States are gathering for the People's Climate March on Saturday. I have to say, we'll be there broadcasting from the People's Climate March in Washington. And last Saturday on Earth Day, we were in Washington for another five-hour broadcast, the March for Science. And I know some of you were probably at a March for Science in Austria as well. People in the U.S. held signs like, ice has no agenda, it just melts. There's no planet B. A woman holding up a sign that says, I'm with her and has an arrow to Mother Earth. By the way, I also want to congratulate the first winners of the Austrian Environmental Journalism Award, who will be announced shortly. Yes, we have a very significant job as journalists, and our job is to go to where the silence is. It is so important to cover grassroots movements. It is absolutely critical. What we have now in Washington, D.C., is an oligarchy. I mean, we have a Secretary of State now, Rex Tillerson, who is the former CEO of the largest private oil corporation in the world, ExxonMobil. The head of the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States, Scott Pruitt, former Oklahoma Attorney General. Oklahoma hardly ever had earthquakes. Now it is the land of quakes with a fracking blitz that's going through the state. He sued the Environmental Protection Agency 14 times and now is the head of it. And then our Secretary of Energy under the Trump administration is the former governor of Texas, Perry, who, when he ran for president twice, was underwritten to the tune of $6 million by Kelsey Warren, the CEO of Energy Transfer Partners that owns the Dakota Access Pipeline that Native Americans have been struggling to prevent for the last almost a year. Um, yes, the governor of Texas, who's now the Secretary of Energy, was on the board of Energy Transfer Partners after he was governor, um, only had to step down as he becomes Secretary of Energy. 
So there are those forces in the United States, but there is a force more powerful. And it is everyone together across the political spectrum, including past Trump supporters, who are deeply concerned right now about the fate of the planet. I really do think that those who are concerned about war and peace, those who are concerned about the growing inequality in our country and the world, those who are concerned about climate change, the fate of the planet, are not a fringe minority, not even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media, which is why we have to take the media back. It is so important that when we cover war, we have a media that's not brought to you by the weapons manufacturers, that when we cover climate change, that's not brought to you by the oil, the gas, the coal companies, that when we cover health care, not brought to you by the insurance industry or big pharma, we need an independent media that goes back to its roots. Um, my brother, also a journalist, a wonderful journalist um, uh, in Vermont, where incidentally we are broadcasting from right now, um, we wrote a book called Static, and the reason we called it that is because even in this high-tech digital age with high-definition television and digital radio, all we get is static. What we need instead is the media to give us the dictionary definition of static, criticism, opposition, unwanted interference. We need a, me we need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history, like Earth Talks. So again, congratulations on your 10th anniversary. I wish I could be joining you personally, but I hope people do tune in on Saturday when Democracy Now! is in the nation's capital in Washington, D.C., doing a five-hour broadcast from the People's Climate March. Eastern time, it's 10 in the morning to 3 p.m. Check it out at democracynow.org. But for now, on with your show. Thank you so much for letting me be a small part of it. Congratulations, Earth Talks. So shot Leidenschaft aus. That's what passion is like. Such a cool lady. Now I may ask someone to come up onto the stage who probably is running around behind the scenes, who is uh, responsible for keeping us together in our location here, making sure we have a good agenda to pursue a big hand for the manager of the Earth Talks, the event manager, André Karsay. Hello, hello. Hi. Your mic. Wow. Is it good for you to be here? This is really comfortable, a sofa, right? Maybe you will think about putting it up here again next year. I may just stay here since it's so comfortable. Do you have some time for a talk? Are you not needed behind the scenes? Well, you'll just take time, and I love taking that time. It's a big honor to be sitting in front of you, looking at this great audience. What a nice image. Everything's running smoothly behind the scenes, as well as at the entrance. That's now the exit. And one reason why everything's running so smoothly is that you always manage to attract as many people as possible to help as volunteers. Just a short clip. Towards the end of the event 2016, we started planning the new one for 2017. That's what it is all about. We are those hunted. We have to work because we want to organize a successful project, a successful event, we want to have a great day, a great week. I only want to say that we are the three faces you know, but there are so many volunteers working backstage. You forget 
that there are so many people you may turn to and ask questions. And when you ask them, could you help me? They say, yes, I'd like to. I have so much time to give today. Why shouldn't I help? It's great to see such a wonderful team. That's what's happening here. We have 70, 80 people in our team who just help us, not for money. They give us their time, their expertise, their motivation, their smiles, because we ask them to help us. And sometimes it needs tears, sweat. When my work's done and when I'm available locally, the adrenaline is going up like that. When you sit down in a room of the Earth Talks, you hear the music and then it says, welcome to the Earth Talks. I always have tears in my eyes because what you've been working for for a year suddenly has become a reality. I can but recommend to every guest to say thank you to a volunteer. Thanks for having donated your time to be a volunteer for the Earth Talks. Well, we all have tears in our eyes. That's always nice to see. What is your motivation? How did you come up ending up in the Earth Talks? Because of a personal encounter with Angie, who asked me whether I could help her. I used to live in Nice back then, and I just went on a journey supporting the first Earth Talks, saying in the clip that tears got into my eyes. Uh, you see I'm trembling now. At 1 p.m. we had the volunteers gathering and it gave me the goosebumps because I'm always extremely overwhelmed when I see how we can motivate people, how they motivate others. I'm not sitting there entering names, but people go to our website, they support us, they ask us how they could help us. That's overwhelming a feeling, I have to say. And last year I said, I'm blown away. And I'm really overwhelmed by the time people donate to our endeavors. When it's over, we've heard you quickly start thinking about what you want to do for the next year. How much of your personal time do you devote to the organization of this event? Well, the three of us are a little family, right? The three and the dog, the dog, the new family member. For us, as you have heard in the clip, well, we start today, actually. As soon as uh, the curtain is lowered, we are going to talk about how to continue with the Earth Talks. We meet one day a week, every Friday, all the year round we meet and all my customers know it's my neon green day every Friday. And sometimes we have a glass of beer together, we have lunch and dinner together and in the event phase shortly before the Earth Talks, I'm kind of a furniture being moved around with Angie and Adam. We don't have a separate office, we are in the living office of their flat. And she said she is the creation and motivation. Adam is the brain and you are the puppet master in the background. Can I put it like this? Well, I would have chosen a nicer term, I must say. I just forgot what Angie said. Maybe she said the one pulling the strings. Yes, that's what I wanted to say. I think I'm a fanatic when it comes to efficiency. I want to touch things once, putting them in the right place and that's how I hope to organize the Earth Talks. The volunteers joining in their efforts and all of the staff who do much more than what they are being paid for, doing their utmost to efficiently cooperate, not thinking, well, I'm here, giving a helping hand uh, free of charge, but uh, to no avail. That should not be the case. Thank you very much. Now we are turning to the next major inspirational input. Sulaksi Baraksa 
is a scholar, servant from Thailand and an activist. You should learn to transform greed into generosity, to transform violence into loving kindness, and to transform delusion into real understanding or wisdom. Gemeinsam mit dem Dalai Lama. Together with Dalai Lama, he founded the international network of engaged Buddhists standing up for liberty, human rights, and protecting the environment. So, you care for all sentient beings. In Vorträgen und Gastprofessuren. As a lecturer and visiting professor, he conveys how spirituality can be used to solve political and ecological conflicts. Two times he has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, and in 1995 he was awarded the Right Livelihood Award. Neon Green Network welcomes Sulak Sivaraksa. Buddhism asserts that a basic human condition is that we are empty and lacking beings. More precisely, we are beings who worry all the time about lacking something and being deficient and incomplete. This condition leads to dissatisfaction and unhappiness. Worse, the common way that promised to lift us from unhappiness ultimately makes us more dissatisfied and depressed. From a Buddhist perspective, that is because they are inseparable from the root cause of suffering, greed, hatred, and delusion. For instance, feeling deficient, we have to consume endlessly. If only I can have that thing, if only I can have more of it, if only I have the latest products which are newer and better, and thus, they will fulfill me. We are always in search of the ultimate product that will make us whole again, forgetting that we were never complete in the first place, that there is no self to return to. Needless to say, this has implications for ecology. We see others as our competitors. If only they are not around, we will be complete and happy. We hate them for robbing us of the happiness that is within our reach, for cutting the line. We are especially threatening when they are immigrants. They even seem to be enjoying themselves by making us unhappy. We are deluded to thinking that there is no alternative to capitalism, either because we buy into its sweet promise for a better future, in which we all will be fulfilled, or because we feel that although capitalism may not be the best system for example, given the gross inequality it breeds and how it intensifies and accelerates ecological degradation, it is unrealistic and impractical to replace it. 
we delude ourselves into believing that nothing has to change, that science and technology will ultimately save us from climate change, that some green billionaire or conservation group will take care of things for us. In short, we become attached to a system that hurts us. Buddhism then claims that the real path to happiness entails the overcoming of greed, hate, and delusion. Or more precisely, that transformation into generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. This is the essence of Buddhism. In a nutshell, the highest goal of Buddhism is to awaken and realize that we can all be enlightened like the Buddha. The Sanskrit word for Buddha means the awakened one. Dhamma or the Buddha's teaching serve as the path towards this awakening. Happiness is not found at the end of this path, but gradually emerges once we are traveling on it. For instance, when we are concerned about the well-being of others, when we practice altruism and solidarity, when we struggle together to make society more equal. Happiness in this sense is grounded in being together and practicing universalism. Put another way, one is not born a Buddhist, but becomes one. Strictly speaking, one becomes a Buddhist by taking what is called the three refuges. I go to the Buddha for refuge. I go to the Dhamma for refuge. I go to the Sangha for refuge. This is the heart of being Buddhist. Let me briefly explain on what going to the Buddha for refuge means. It means I don't go to spirits, celestial beings, evil ones for refuge. Nor do I go to the military generals, the president, bankers, politicians, fortune tellers, movie stars. I do not depend on them for protection from danger. Only the Buddha is able to help me to try to overcome danger or fear. We are filled with fear. Fear is part of our nature. Why? We fear being deficient and incomplete. We fear pain, old age, death, suffering, losing our property, losing our loved ones, losing our status and reputation. We become anxious and angry at the dangers. We have those who instill fear in us. We are lured by cheap answers that promise to rid us of these fears. In Buddhism, when fear is overcome, danger will disappear. When this happens, we will learn to forgive even our enemies. This is because for Buddhists, the primary enemies are greed, hatred, and delusion. But there's a little twist in what going to the Buddha for refuge means. The Buddha states, I quote, you are your own master, O oh, my follower. You should not accept my teaching out of faith but rather through investigation and experiment." End of quote. In other words, even though we take refuge in the Buddha, he is not like a supreme leader who prohibits or forces us into things. He does demand our blind obedience. Moreover, he does not even have the power to make us happy. 
Only we can make ourselves happy. Ultimately, taking refuge in the Buddha implies that we are the answer that we have been waiting for. To sum up briefly, going to the Buddha for refuge implies that as ordinary people, we can follow the Buddha's path, that we can likewise be enlightened. The path is spelled out in the teaching, the Dhamma, and embodied by the Sangha, the community of those ordained believers. The Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha are thus like three rings that make up a single knot. Taking three refuges nourishes the ground for the seeds of Buddha nature to grow in a devotee. Put another way, Buddha nature is latent within each and every one of us. We will enable it to flourish or strive its growth. But I am not here to fossilize you. Anyone who finds the Dhamma valuable in helping to overcome suffering should be able to practice it without having to convert to Buddhism. The Dhamma benefits everyone, Buddhists as well as non-Buddhists, even non-believers. For instance, the practice of mindfulness may help to lessen self-attachment and minimize exploitation in interpersonal relations. For non-Buddhists and non-believers, the Dhamma can serve as what the Dalai Lama calls secular spirituality, or a kind of spirituality that is practical. Spirituality, as everyone practices, a sense of concern over the other's well-being. A point that cannot be overemphasized is that suffering is not only personal, but also social and environmental. Depression or unhappiness is not primarily because of chemical imbalance in your body. Rather, personal, social, and environmental sufferings are interconnected in the web of life. It may not be readily apparent, but capitalism and consumerism are the leading cause of violence and suffering in the present world. When we can see through all the connections, possibility to end suffering with wisdom may emerge. As such, Buddhism must be concerned equally about personal and social transformation which are like the two sides of the same coin. This is because humans are interrelational beings. This not Han even calls human beings interbeing. In other words, we cannot afford to, as David Lloyd put it, I quote, be indifferent to what is happening to others and the world generally. In this respect, Buddhism must reinvent itself to be able to cope with the multifaceted challenges of the modern world, from social appetite to climate change. To continue this train of thought, the reduction and eventual elimination of class inequality is important. Buddhism must pay attention to political economy. I would even risk an argument. Good Buddhists have to be anti-capitalist and a bit of a Marxist. <laughs> or for a non-Buddhist and non-believer, in order to be happy, you have to be anti-capitalist and a bit of a Marxist. I am not the first person to make this claim. If you recall, the Dalai Lama even asserted that he is a Marxist. As he stated in 1993, I quote, the economic system of Marxism is founded on moral principles. 
while capitalism is concerned only with gain and profitability, Marxism is concerned with the distribution of wealth on an equal basis, as well as the fate of those who are underprivileged and in need. And it cares about the victims of minority imposed exploitation. For this reason, the system appealed to me and it seemed fair." End of quote. In sum, the Dalai Lama implies that both Buddhism and Marxism defend equalitarianism and are concerned about the marginalized, the voiceless, the invisible in the world. Equally important, like Marxism, Buddhism, too, is critical of the way of the world. It's concerned about changing the world. Happiness must take place in this life and this world rather than the next one. The way of this world, however, are not conducive to happiness of the majority of people. The point then is to change the world. In other words, if you don't want to talk about capitalism, you should remain silent on happiness. <laughs> the same logic applies to tackling climate change. I also raised the problem of class inequality and political economy in an event on environmentalism because ecological catastrophes often hurt the poor and the social excluded more gravely than the rich and the powerful. Think of environmental racism and climate refugees, for instance. This is where the international network of engaged Buddhism come in. No, INEP is not a Marxist organization but it is likewise interested in making sense of and addressing the social, political, economic, and ecological causes of suffering. It asserts that Buddhism can act as a platform for not a very to emancipation, hence the name Engaged Buddhism. Sometimes this, from a Buddhist point of view, it's called socially engaged Buddhism or socially engaged spirituality. Social engaged Buddhism implies that there's also a kind of Buddhism that may be atomistic, obsessed with individual happiness and salvation, sociopathic. And when Buddhism acts in this mode, it becomes, as Mark put it, of religion, the opium of the people. It becomes a barrier to social change by helping to stabilize or sugarcoat the unjust social order. Take the example of meditation. Has meditation not transformed into a truly ideological and therefore safe practice? Is it not a way to help one escape back into reality as it is? Is it not a practice that is possible and achievable within capitalism? In one online article published by Business Insider entitled 14 Things Successful People Do Before Breakfast, <laughs> meditation is on the list. Here, successful people mean the world's richest folks, the plutocrats. Remember that we are living in a world in which eight individuals have as much wealth as half the world's population. The article claims, I quote, before they head out the door, many successful people devote themselves to a spiritual practice such as meditation or prayer, to center themselves for the rush of the day, end of quote. Small wonder that David Loy asked this in his wonderful little book, 
a new Buddhist path. I quote, Is Western Buddhism being commodified and co-opted into a self-help stress reduction program that adapts to institutionalize dukkha, that is suffering, leaving practitioners atomized and powerless. End of quote. Needless to say, NGA's Buddhism is not against meditation. It merely asserts that mainstream meditation enables its practitioners to be fully awake in the capitalist world. The point, however, is to force a disruptive awakening to change the world. As David Lloyd clearly stressed, modern Buddhism should be, I quote again, modern Buddhism should be opening up new perspectives and possibilities that challenge us to transform ourselves and our society so that they become more socially just and ecologically sustainable. End of quote. Back to INEP, which was founded in 1989. INEP is a truly international network. Today it operates in more than 25 countries on different continents. It links Buddhists from various sects together. It cooperates with other religious groups as well as non-believers. Briefly, INEP see Buddhism as a social religion and puts Buddhism to reinvent itself in order to confront some of the main challenges of the 21st century, from climate change to class inequality. Please check out the INEP website to keep track of its current activities. More recently, when I received the Chumna Bhajat Award in India in the year 2014, I used the whole prize money to set up a university for social and care Buddhism under the rubric of INEP. This university now offers an MA degree in socially engaged Buddhism. To conclude this short talk, I, I would like to stress again that engaged Buddhism is for development. But in a Buddhist sense, the Buddhist word for de development is bhavana. It entails appropriate physical growth based on nonviolence, social growth on cooperation and solidarity, mental growth on selflessness, and spiritual growth on liberation of the individual as well as all sentient beings. Thank you for your attention. to ask you, I think that many people, um, and the reaction in this room proves it, many people feel that you are right, that capitalism and greed has made us unhappy and is ultimately destroying our planet. But still, this seems to be the way the world runs. Do you have any hope? The, the fall of capitalism has been predicted many times. Do you have any hope that humanity will change its way? we can make capitalism better. I give you a concrete example in my own country. A group of entrepreneurs have formed themselves calling Social Venture Network. These entrepreneurs don't only look for profit. Number one, they look at themselves, many capitalists worked so hard just for money. But now many of them feel that they should spend some time for themselves and their family, honor members of their family, and honor those who work for them. Let the labor also have share in their company. 
that the labor leaders also join the board of management and they come together that they must not exploit nature. We use nature appropriately. Mm -hmm. And we don't use advertising to tell lies to people. And certain amount of profit they share with NGO, try to change the world in a better. I'm pretty sure in Austria you must have this. Because although you can get, not get away of capitalism, make capitalism more reasonable. And the capitalist people could be wonderful people. <laughs> Do you believe, as you observe the world, that capitalism, at least in parts of the world, is getting better, is evolving in a way? You know, ideally, capitalism is certainly promoting greed. But if you can talk to some of those entrepreneurs that they can limit their greed and they can make profit not entirely for greed to share the profit you see in buddhism sharing giving is more important than taking and once you have this understanding thing could work better than it stands So, as we are uh, heading for a home stretch this evening, I wanted to ask all of you, our keynote speakers who have inspired us tonight, what your takeaway is from this evening, from the other speakers you've heard about. What's your message you can take away uh, from this evening? Andrea, you have the very difficult um, task of going first. <laughs> <laughs> you have time? <laughs> um. Well, it, to me, that I, it's very, very nice to see different angles and different approach to the, pretty much the same problem. And, uh, and, and we have an example here on this stage, and, and I'm sure in the, in, in, in the audience as well. So it's, it's from a, my mind, was always looking for innovation from different angles. It's, it's very enriching to see same goal, but very, very different uh, approaches and angles and... and and ideas, so that's it's very, very important for me to see. Thank you. Bonnie? <laughs> I think that activism and interest to make change is growing, as the size of this audience demonstrates. But we cannot be complacent. We actually have to act collectively, have courage to do it, and don't wait for tomorrow, do it today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mr. Sivaraksa. I learned from you, you know, anger should be acknowledged. <laughs> and then you can transform anger into wisdom and the work will be more accomplished. I used to belong to Green Peace Southeast Asia and they are tremendous working. But I feel that if they can learn to breathe more properly, some to overcome anger, it would help. I myself was fighting against Total and Unicor together. They're building gas pipeline from Burma to my country. And I tried to stop them, but they put me in jail. But I have to learn not to hate them. And in this case, I was defeated. I was put in jail. Luckily, I won the case after fighting for four years. So I, I want to share my experience with you. And I admire you for climbing. I would like to thank all of you, we've almost reached the end, so thank you for your appreciation, thank you for listening, and since we'd like to distribute 
thanks to all the people who've made this evening possible, I'd like to give the floor to you, André. Thank you. I would like to join, what, join in what Sulak just told us. I think it's about making things better, and not just uh, to make profits. So I'm thinking, of course, about you, the keynote speakers, the volunteers. Of course, you're all volunteers, the people who are helping behind the scenes, but there are also two companies that I would like to thank in particular. That's Bernhard A.V. with Christine Bernhard, uh, Denise Katzter, Stefan Reisek, and her wonderful team who are making sure that the technology is working, that we have cameramen and women, and that everything is working perfectly. And this is a company that does a lot more uh, than just generate profits. They are EMS certified since 2015. They are probably the greenest technical uh, provider that uh, can provide uh, video projection, etc. And to our hearts and minds, they're also the greatest company. And we don't call our sponsors sponsors, we call them partners. So everything that you see here was uh, based on partnership. Of course, we talked a lot about ourselves, about our own team, but we also work with uh, the company Bernhard and the third partner, whom we'd like to name is Halle E. The premise is here. I think this is the greatest event location we could find. I have organized such events in many locations. I've never seen a house where everything is possible, where every employee is friendly, and of course, uh, uh, as we say, the fish starts stinking at the head. So if there's a good boss at the head of a company, then of course uh, they also tend to have great employees and uh, would like to thank them very much for their excellent cooperation. All right, now let's come to the final stretch. At first, we're going to have a little get together of the core team. And I would like to ask you for a big round of applause for our culinary team, Sasha and Brita Azanovic. Our team that have provided us with the culinary delights. Angie and Adam. Is to join us for uh, for some group pictures over there, and while we do that, I'm asking you, Adam, for the last acknowledgement for this evening, if you will, for a neon green, neon green adventure. I will, but Andre would like to say something first. Yes, I, I think we have a fourth, uh, no, one, two, three, four, five, six team member. That's Uli who has been doing the visuals and uh, surprisingly arrived from Germany today and he's been sitting and watching the Earth Talks tonight. So Uli, would you come down and join us on stage? <laughs> it's a surprise for them. Das war jetzt wirklich auch eine Überraschung. Also Angie ja, wir brauchen ein Close-Up von der Angie, die heult gleich wieder. <lacht> Vor lauter Freude. Wir brauchen ein Close-Up von Angie, sie wird nicht in einer Minute schreien. Uli, magst du noch was sagen? Uli hat nichts zu sagen. Um, Uli hat nichts zu sagen, so. Ja, wir versuchen auch jedes Jahr. Jahr auf Jahr, apart from the Earth Talks, we also try to support other projects. The project that we have supported this year was de developed over the past two or three years based on uh, our project of divestment from fossil fuels. So this is a video 
presentation. It's called climate.net, and there are two or three representatives of this platform whom would like to ask to quickly stand up and uh, turn to the audience for their applause. In a minute, we're going to learn about this organization in the video. If you'd like to know more about this, then please talk to those three gentlemen during the networking exercise. And now we'll watch the video. CLIMA stands for Clean Financial Markets. The objective of CLIMA.net is to create more transparency in financial markets to reduce its carbon footprint because many investment funds that are characterized as being sustainable have a lot of uh, fossil fuel use. And the label of Klima offers a database with sustainable products. A customer sees at one glance who really does clean business. And since we have talked so much about you, and since we're so grateful that many of you are coming back year after year, even though you know how much work this entails, I would like to ask all those volunteers to join us here on this stage, also the team leaders, and please give them a large round of applause. Thank you very much to all of you. I'm interrupting your applause in order to say thank you formally to all our partners who are helping us organize this evening. Thanks to the Ministry for Livable Austria, MA22, the Vienna Environmental Agency, the Ökostrom AG, Bernhard AV, WWF, Rogner Bad Blumau, Mutter Erde, Mother Earth, the Greens, Sonnentor, Zotter, Schachinger Logistik, and der Google. So thank you very much to all volunteers. Thank you to the audience. You've been very appreciative. The second and very important part of the evening will follow networking behind the stage, and the band Schönheitsfehler will be with us until 2 o'clock in the morning with the DJ. Thank you.